Jonathan Dahan, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Shizuoka in Japan, and I'm the director of an undergraduate game lab. And I'd like to talk briefly about some problems that I've encountered in my research on game-based language teaching. I'll describe some problems related to noticing, understanding, and using language from games. And I'll also try to suggest some possible solutions to these problems. I think that the right game, appropriate supplemental tasks and materials, and the overall teaching approach are very important to consider. So some of the earliest research I did with games was to understand the effect of interactivity on second language acquisition. I ran two studies, one with a music game and one with a collection of mini games in which students of paired proficiencies either played the game or watched a simultaneous feed of the game being played. In both, both groups were asked to recall vocabulary from the game that they had played or watched. In both of these studies, watchers recalled two or three times as much language as players, both on immediate and delayed post-tests. Though the players were immersed, uh, they were telepresent in the game worlds, the physical interactivity of the games prevented players from noticing and remembering language. Gameplay can cause cognitive overload and get in the way of students noticing language in games. Of course, a solution to this problem is to not use games in this way. Teachers shouldn't ask students to play games without being able to pause the game, take notes, talk with other students, use dictionaries, or use language in subsequent tasks. Games aren't content delivery machines. They're not magic bullets. Appropriate teaching and tasks need to be connected to appropriate games. Games without constant physical activity, interactivity, such as turn-based strategy games or board games, can let students choose when to focus their attention on the game or the language. Ideally, language should drive gameplay, such as in some interactive fiction games and puzzle games or RPGs. And if you plan to develop a complicated game, early playtesting can reveal whether cognitive load may be a concern, and if you should add or remove certain multimedia elements like subtitles or repetition to decrease cognitive load. So after those previous studies in which I gave students no control over the game or learning, I built a self-access game library at a university and gave students complete control over when and how they played video games to learn language. I observed many pairs of students working together to play games in their second language. One student played the game, and the other student used their dictionary to look up new words. Because they played and learned in pairs, they naturally verbalized what they didn't know, and they worked together to understand and use new language appropriately in the game. Asking students to play games together is another simple solution to the problem of cognitive overload from playing games in a second language. So, as you know, as you're probably familiar with, research studies have demonstrated that using supplemental materials with games, like worksheets and, and, and other vocabulary guides, is more effective than just using games alone. You can look at Miller and Hagelheimer or Rinaldi, right, or Sykes and Reinhardt. Right? So in this game library, I made diaries for students to use, and many students used them. One of the diary items asked students to write down new language in the games that they played. I wanted to find out if the diary helped students remember vocabulary, so I sampled 10 frequent users in the library, collected all their diaries, and used the vocabulary items they had written on their diaries to create vocabulary tests for each of them. On average, students only got 15% correct on these tests of words that they had noticed for their first time while playing games. The diaries, just taking notes, were not sufficient to aid in remembering language from games. Shortly after that, my lab worked with some high school students who were interested in video games. The high school students chose a game from the lab to take home and play a few times a week for a month, completing a game diary each time they played. At the beginning and end of the month, we gave the high school students a vocabulary and grammar test based on their particular game and observed gameplay, and we interviewed them about their, their experience playing the game. The students were free to play with friends and family and use dictionaries or textbooks as they wished. 
This chart shows the raw scores on the vocabulary and grammar tests pre and post. As you can see, the students learned some vocabulary from the games, but did not improve their grammar abilities. It's possible that the repeated play over the month helped students notice more vocabulary from the game, but just based on the raw score difference, I think that if the goal is just to introduce students to new vocabulary, assigning paper-based or even smartphone app flashcards of vocabulary would probably be a more effective approach in terms of time and money. Admittedly, we also didn't have the students in this project do anything with the vocabulary or content of the game. We didn't ask them to use the English from the games in conversations or role plays. We didn't ask them to critique the game or discuss the characters or stories. The project scope was very narrow and made me think more about what else could be done with games. So to go back to the game library context, I developed a worksheet that had students do deeper functional analyses of a particular word or expression they noticed in a game. Students did not complete as many of these more elaborate worksheets, but I could see that these explicit analyses helped students better understand, remember, and actually use new language from games in subsequent conversations and tasks outside of the game. I asked another group of students to complete an analysis task. The students collected language from the game's stories and instructions, supplemented their notes with transcriptions and walkthroughs found online, then they used various online vocabulary analysis tools to find and explain patterns in the language from games. Many of these patterns were new to the students, but this analysis task did take the students several days to complete. I'd like to come back to the problem of quality versus quantity of learning with games a bit later. So 21st century education is a popular concept. I recognize that the idea of these work-focused skills in education is a bit problematic, but I wanted to give early career experience to some first and second year undergrads to help them stand out in their difficult job hunting process in their fourth year. So I used some 21st century skill themes to create new projects for a diverse group of students. The critical thinking group used their English to play test and help develop board games for international companies. The collaboration group competed in a local business plan contest. They wanted to make a board game to help increase tourism. The communication group set up an after school game club for elementary students in our neighborhood. The creativity group worked together to design a board game every day for 30 days. The undergrads really enjoyed the projects and the experience did help some of them get internships, study abroad opportunities and jobs. However, in reflecting on these projects, I realized that students were participating without building deeper experience or knowledge about games. They seemed to be applying, but in many cases, cases just practicing what they were already able and interested in doing. In these projects, I found some great ways for students to apply or extend what they might learn through, with, and around about games, right? To con connect that to Julie Sykes and John Reinhardt's work. But these projects alone didn't seem to be enough to develop their academic knowledge and skills. PBL, project-based learning projects, can involve more open-ended driving questions and require students to gather more information to complete the project. This could have been a better way to approach game-based project projects, but it also would have taken more time than I had had with these groups. Again, the issue of quality versus quantity comes up. Supporting students as they read extensively on their game-based interests, gain experience in a variety of social situations, and craft driving questions for themselves is something that can happen in some contexts. For example, my thesis seminar, which runs for two years, but it may be very difficult to implement in language classes or programs that don't have that much time or freedom. In working to build a better teaching model with games that includes playing, noticing, understanding, building academic skills and participation outside the university, I've begun to notice sim similarities in various frameworks that might help to develop teaching and learning with games. There seems to be overlaps in the goals and methods of multiliteracies pedagogy, social culturally informed approaches to teaching and learning with games. Again, look at, at Julie Sykes and John Reinhardt's work, media education, 21st century education and connected learning. These models move students from playing to production through a core of academically rigorous concept building and research. In one example of a project that drew from these various teaching domains, 
I helped students create an English game magazine on issue.com. The students played lots of games and they chose one each to deeply understand and explain. They used worksheets and discussions to critique and analyze first and second language online and in print game reviews. They looked at organization, verbs, how to give positive and negative opinions, layout issues. They drafted their review. They appropriated a great deal of the language they had noticed. They did peer review and then did the final production work and uploaded their finished product to the online site. This class project was really successful in that it was grounded in students' experience, analysis helped them build understanding of games and language and media, and they were able to apply their knowledge in creative communicative participation for an authentic purpose. In another example of a combination of multiliteracies pedagogy, media education, and language teaching, my lab ran a game camp for high school students. They played new and familiar English board games, classroom games, and video games. They analyzed and designed, or they analyzed and discussed games, game advertisements, and game industry interviews. They then created their own online game, a print advertisement for their game, gave a presentation and an interview at a public mock game release industry event. I think this project too was also successful because students appropriated various media elements into their design work. They learned a lot about the game industry and they better understood the creator audience relationship and they improved various English vocabulary, grammar, speaking, and writing skills. So to try to wrap up quickly, some problems in teaching and learning with games, like students not noticing language, these can be solved by using the right game or using the right task, such as pair work, a specifically designed worksheet, or an analysis task. We can make sure that students learn more critical and academic skills by connecting different teaching and learning activities to accomplish specific goals. There's one final pitfall of game-based learning game-based teaching and learning, it's really worth talking about, the pitfall of hype. The larger field of educational games has certainly experienced excessive hype about the potential of games to revolutionize education. Just in the case of educational film, radio, TV, computers, the internet, any other technology that educators and researchers have been attracted to. I think we're all gamers, and many of our students are gamers. And as we've seen at many conferences, there are many potential benefits to using games. But I think that we need to be careful not to succumb to the Everest principle of having to use a technology just because it's there. Even though games and simulations have been used for decades in education and language education in particular, I agree right, with, with Julie Sykes, Jonathan Reinhardt, and many, many others that our field is still in its infancy. So we have an excellent opportunity to set the tone for what teaching and research happens in our field. In order to not, in order to not fall prey to the hype, or at least get past the hype. I think we need to be very deliberate about situating games into the broader ecology, into a broader ecolo educational ecology. Learning goals, the students, the educational context and constraints, social trends, teacher knowledge and skills, pedagogical frameworks, strategies, materials, these all have to be carefully considered and integrated critically. So I work and blog and, and collaborate with a group of other language teachers and researchers at Ludic Language Pedagogy. And I, I'd like to think that, that we're starting to get past the hype of games. We've found that there aren't many technology shortcuts to good education. James York, for example, teaches low-level learners and is finding a lot of success by using a multi-skill, task-based language teaching approach with modern board games, not video games. Peter Hortican runs a game program out of his university's self-access center and has been using a Socratic approach in quick cycles of play and discussion to develop students' awareness and understanding of the complexities of language and meaning in the many games their group is interested in. And Peter and James really helped me create a, a multi-literacies-based after-school program at my university. One of my students is playing and analyzing a train board game, reading online reviews of the game and learning about English sarcasm, analyzing their own language use while playing the game, writing essays about the magic circle as they experienced it in their games, and plans to do historical research about our local area to create their own Shizuoka map to share with other fans of the game. This project's ongoing, and some of the activities have changed in some really wonderful ways. I think that all of these last projects rely more on good teaching 
than good games. One main problem I still see going forward is the trade-off between quality and quantity. My students are diving deeper into the games and gaining skills and develop knowledge by doing so. But these projects have been small group projects run more than one semester a year, which makes it hard to scale up or integrate this in typical classes. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on the quantity versus quality issue in teaching with games. I'd be very grateful if you can point out any, any potential problems that I haven't seen yet in the recent projects I've described. I'd be really interested to learn more about the successful teaching approaches you're using with games, language, culture, or any other domain. And of course, I'm looking forward to continuing our discussions on how to critically and carefully move the field forward. Thank you very much.